With web applications becoming more and more dependent upon JavaScript, sometimes you find yourself duplicating logic across your Rails application and the JavaScript on the client side. Validations, for example, is a common situation for this. Now you can see this on this Rails application here where I have a form which accepts a membership number. And if I enter in any old random number inside of here, it's going to say it's an invalid membership number. But if I enter in a proper number in here, it will the error message will disappear. Now this validation is only happening on the client side, which is a problem because if the user submits the form with JavaScript disabled, I'll show you here. If they submit the form and don't have JavaScript enabled, it's always important to have validations backed up on the server side so that the user can't submit the form and create a record that is actually invalid. Now the validation logic for that membership number is actually fairly complicated. It uses the mod 10 algorithm and you can see the JavaScript right here. So we have a couple of choices. We could either duplicate this logic in Ruby or actually execute this exact same JavaScript inside of Ruby on the server side. And if you have a Rails 3.1 application, you may have been doing this already without even knowing it. So if you check out the gem file of a Rails 3.1 app, you can see that there is a coffee Rails gem here, and that will need to execute JavaScript in order to compile the coffee script. And it does this through a gem called execjs. Now execjs is pretty cool because it supports a variety of JavaScript runtimes, and it will just choose the best one that's available on the given system and it provides a common interface for interacting with and compiling with JavaScript. As you can see, you can just execute some JavaScript here and it will return some Ruby, or you can compile a source file like this. So let's use execjs here to read in this JavaScript file and then execute this validation function. So I need to add this validation to the member model that I have set up here. So let's add a custom validate call here to check a membership number. And then I need to define that method call check membership number. So let's first fetch the source of that JavaScript file and we can do file read and then fetch the path, which is at rails root. And then that's at app assets, JavaScripts, and then it's called membership um, number.js. And then we could just tell execjs to compile that source JavaScript. And this will return a context, which we can then call various functions off of. So we can call context.call to execute a function. The first argument is the name of the function, which is called is valid uh, membership number. And then the other arguments are just going to be passed into that function. So we could just pass in our membership number here, which will be the attribute on this model. And then that will be returning true or false when we call that function. So if that membership number is not valid, then we can call uh, errors.add and then add our membership number here and then pass in the say is an invalid number, just like that. So let's try this out by filling out an invalid number in our membership and then trying to submit the form by bypassing JavaScript. And then it falls back to the old validation behavior in Rails telling, telling us the number is invalid. But if we enter in a valid one, notice we don't get any client side validation error because it's valid and then it creates it successfully. So this is really awesome because now we're able to share logic across the client side and the server side through JavaScript and compiling it through Ruby using execjs here. Now you probably don't want to compile and read the source file every single time you do a validation check. That's not very efficient. So you probably want to cache that context here and I will show you an example on how to do that near the end of this episode. What I wanna do next though is take this a step further and interact with JavaScript as if it were Ruby. So if you take a look at the available execjs runtimes that it supports, you can see one is the Ruby racer. And there are a lot of awesome things that you could do with the Ruby racer here. Let me show you. So the first thing we need to do is add the Ruby racer to our gem file here. And then we need to tell it to require the V8 file and then run the bundle command to install the gem. Now let me show you some of the cool things you could do with this gem in the console here. So the first thing to do is create a V8 context calling v8context.new. And then on that context, we could just evaluate some JavaScript here, and then we'll get the uh, response back here in Ruby. Or we could assign variables from Ruby, and then call eval on this, and then access that variable from inside of the JavaScript here. Or we could even create an entire JavaScript object here. So let's make one called math, and give it a square function here. And then that will just return that times itself. 
And then if we ex execute this by calling math and then just act like it's a Ruby, Ruby method here, just call square and then pass it a number, it will return the uh, JavaScript result. Or you can even go the other way and pass in a Ruby Lambda here. So I'll just do n times itself again. And then when we execute that inside of uh, JavaScript here, we can just pass in any value here, and then it will be evaluated in the JavaScript side, but it's actually calling that Ruby Lambda. So as you can see, there are a lot of cool things that you can do with the Ruby racer to bridge the gap between JavaScript and Ruby. Now let me show you a practical example on how you can use this. Now what I have right here on this page is something we created in episode 295, where I have a list of products, and when you scroll down to the bottom, it does endless scrolling. So it's doing this by using mustache templates to render out these products right here, and we're actually sharing the same template across Ruby and JavaScript. So the first few records get rendered out on the Ruby side, and then later on, these get rendered out through JavaScript using the JSON data that we get from our Rails application. Now, if you're sharing templates like this between Ruby and JavaScript, you often have logic that goes along with it that you need to share as well. Now, in this case, the shared logic is the formatting of the price and the release date right here. And the way I worked around this problem in episode 295 is that I formatted the data before I sent it off to JavaScript through JSON. And that works okay in this situation, but if you have other scenarios, sometimes it's nicer to work just with the raw data in JavaScript and format it in the JavaScript side. So if you check out the controller here, you can see we're doing some special formatting of the JSON response here. But instead of doing all this, what I wanna do is just return the raw JSON data here of the products, and that way I can format it on the JavaScript side. So this means I need to change my mustache template here because that JSON response contained a URL attribute that I no longer have access to. So I'm just going to use ID here and just manually specify the products path here. Now you may want to customize your JSON output to actually do return the URL. I consider that a good practice because it's not really formatted data. And one other change we need to make is where we render that mustache template out in Ruby. Right now we're passing in that custom formatted data and we just wanna pass in the raw JSON attributes. So we can call product.asJSON and that will return a hash of attributes for the JSON response so it matches. So now you can see when I reload this page here that the price and release date are no longer formatted. They're just the raw uh, strings that we get from the JSON response. So now let's focus on formatting this on the client side in JavaScript. So if you check out the JavaScript that's currently being executed on the client side, you can see that when we render out the products here, what we're doing is just looping through all of the product responses that we get from JSON and then passing that directly to our mustache template here when we render it out. What we wanna do though is make an intermediate object that we, we pass these JSON attributes to and then we can handle the formatting logic inside of that object and then we pass that object to our mustache template. So here's the way it will work. Uh, let's call the response that we get from JSON just product attributes. And then let's create a new product object from those product attributes. So let's make a product class here and then pass in those product attributes here, just like that. So now this product object here is what's being passed into the mustache template, but we need to make a product class. So let me make a new file here called uh, product.js.coffee. So inside of here, let's make a new class called product and let's give it a constructor and we'll assign it some attributes here and that will automatically handle the assigning to the attributes variable there for us. Now for a couple of these functions on here, I'm just going to delegate directly to our attributes here. So we got our ID and our name right here. And then for the price, we need our formatting logic, but for now I'll just put in a placeholder called price and then we have our release stat attribute, which I'll just say date. So this looks good for now, but a quick tip here to get a class available outside of the current file because we need to access the product class inside of the products CoffeeScript file. To do that, we would actually have to call product equals product. And that way it sets it to this, which is going to be the current window so we can access it outside of this file. So now if I reload this page here, you can see that the first few records stay the same. And that's because those are being rendered by Ruby. But if I scroll down here, you can see anything that's added through JavaScript has our placeholder data because that is going through our product class we just created. And what I wanna do 
is, uh, well, we need to format the price and date correctly, but before I do that, I want to focus on adding this behavior to the Ruby side so that it all looks the same and that it's all executing that same JavaScript. So to accomplish this, I need to change the object that I'm passing into my mustache template here in Ruby, because right now I'm just passing in the plain old uh, JSON data, but I don't wanna do that. I wanna pass in the actual JavaScript object, just like I'm doing on the JavaScript side. And this means that I have to actually instantiate a new product based off of the product class in JavaScript. So I'm going to do all of this inside of the product model here. I'll make a for mustache method on here that I can call. So inside of the product model here, let's make that for mustache method. And then we need to make that V8 context here to get us started. Now, since our product class over here is in CoffeeScript and not normal JavaScript, we can't simply load it up directly into the context. We first have to compile it. Now, uh, to do this, I'm just going to fetch the CoffeeScript file content with file.read, and then we can do, it's relative to the Rails root, it's at app assets, JavaScripts, and then at product.js.coffee, like that. And then we can compile that into JavaScript by calling coffeescript.compile, and this is provided by the CoffeeScript gem, which is already loaded up in Rails 3.1. Uh, we just pass in the CoffeeScript source there to get the JavaScript. And then we can execute that by calling context.eval and then passing in that JavaScript code there. And then finally, we can instantiate a new product by calling a new product and then passing in the JSON representation of this product. So we can say to JSON, and that'll return uh, a string containing all of the JSON data uh, for this product. So in essence, what we're doing here is mimicking what we're doing on the client side, where we're creating a new product and then passing in the JSON data that we normally pass to the client. So it behaves exactly the same way. And this returns a Ruby object, but it just wraps this JavaScript object, so it behaves the same way when we end up passing it to the mustache template on the server side here. So now this means when I reload this page here, instead of this raw JSON output here, I'm going to see my placeholder data that I have in the JavaScript class because it is using that on the server side when it renders out these first few products here. So now it's just a matter of going to our JavaScript and replacing this placeholder data with the logic necessary to do the formatting however we want it to look. So it's quite a bit of code, so I just pasted it in here to uh, format the price and the release date. And now when I reload this page here, you can see that it's properly formatted. We have our price value and our release date looking just like it did before, but this time it's all in JavaScript, both on the client side and on the server side. So now the functionality of this is pretty much done, but what about performance? Because right now this isn't very efficient. For every product it has to render, it has to read out the CoffeeScript, compile it to JavaScript, and then parse that JavaScript. So it would be nice if we could cache the context here so that it doesn't have to do all of this every single time. So a quick way to do this is just to store it on a thread variable. So we could do thread.current and then set maybe, let's call it product v8, and only set it if it's not set already. And we can tap this context here and put it inside a block here so that it's it all uh, only gets processed the first time. And then we have to evaluate on this variable here, down here, and that's it. That way this block of code will only run the first time. Now, one thing to watch out for though, when you're caching this entire context object like this is memory leaks, because this object right here will never get garbage collected. And if you're doing something complex in the JavaScript here, like setting inst or setting variables or something, then that will just build up and build up and never be released. So uh, this code I tested right here doesn't look like it has a memory leak. So it seems that instantiating a class like this works fine, but um, you may wanna just be aware of that. If you wanna play it safe, you may wanna just cache the JavaScript string here using something like memcached and then just evaluate that in a new context every time here. Well, that finishes up this episode on running JavaScript code within Ruby. I hope you enjoyed it.